All right. Welcome, everybody. We want to welcome the resident applicants to come to University of Washington. Welcome. We hope that you find this place to be a friendly place and a place where um, the residents are great and they get a great education. So my job is to introduce the grand announcement speaker today. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Brandon Westover here from Harvard Medical School. He's in town for the American Epilepsy Society, and he was kind enough to stay to help give grand rounds. He's an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He is the director of critical care EEG monitoring at Massachusetts General Hospital. He did his MD PhD at Washington University. That's probably the link why he's here. Um, and his residency and fellowship training was done at NGH. Clinically, he's interested in applying EEG to help care for patients with acute neurologic conditions such as delirium, anoxic brain injury, status epilepticus, and delayed cerebral ischemia following subarachnoid hemorrhage. His research interests include automated methods for interpreting clinical EEG data, which we heard about a little bit last week, closed loop control and of sedation and analgesia, biomedical informatics, probabilistic analysis of medical decisions, and the neurophysiology of pain which is really important, sedation and delirium in critically ill patients. Dr. Westover's overarching research goal is to improve neurocritical care through the application of engineering principles applied mathematics and computation. In fact, I think that's one of the common links why um, Brian um, crossed paths with him when he did his clinical rotation at, at MGH as a resident. So that's definitely a possibility for people considering the University of Washington. Um, his talk today is pharmacologically induced coma, neurophysiology, and closed loop control. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Brandon Westover. Put this on. Not sure I'll do this right. There we go. Okay. Um, so, so thanks for the nice introduction, Leo. Um, actually. Just a, a quick story. Leo and I were in a course together more than a decade ago now about how to give a talk. And at the end of his talk, Leo, it was about prions, and he took out a Tupperware container, which he said had brains in it. Did, I think it really did. And he took a bite. And that, that made a real impression, and it's hard act to follow. <laughs> um, but I, I'm happy to be here. So let me, let me start with a question. Um, so how many of you have been involved in, in caring for a patient where the treatment was, was to intubate the patient and then start a high dose anesthetic infusion. All right, so a lot of people, and how many of you worried that we might be doing more harm than good to this patient? And so it's a, it's a common worry you know, at, at Mass General and everywhere in the country, I think, and in the other places. So I'm gonna talk about what happens to the brain when we do this, and then how we can make it safer. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a video, uh, if I can get it going. All right, so this, my wife says this is the most boring video in the world. Um, but I, it's, it's actually not. So yeah. <laughs> there's more boring ones. So there, there, this is a, an operating room monitor, right, that we have our cameraman with a little shakiness. But there's four seconds of EEG data here. And, um, and uh, we have four channels just on the forehead. And this patient's receiving propofol for a routine, routine uh, surgery. And what you'll see, so first you're going to see as the propofol takes effect, um, these sort of fast oscillations, you see them here appearing. And this is called paradoxical excitation because it's, it's sort of like the patient is more awake, but they're really going to sleep. And then uh, in a second, you're going to see some big, big slow waves. All right, so here, here they come, these kind of mountainous slow waves. At this point, the patient could be, you know, is actually deep enough to be operated on. But this patient got a little too much propofol, and so there's another transition you're starting to see now. And this is this transition where, where we're having periods that are where the EEG is, is very flat. These are called suppressions. And then these periods of, of sort of activity where it turns back on, these are the bursts. They last about two seconds. And uh, within the burst, there's an activity that's about uh, 10 to 13 cycles per second. We call this the alpha activity, very characteristic of uh, the EEG under, the, under propofol anesthesia in a healthy brain. So this, this alternating pattern of bursts and, burst and suppressions is called burst suppression. It has an unfortunate acronym, um, which I'll try not to use. 
Um, but so why do we do this to patients? Um, let me talk about sort of three different uses. Uh, so the first one, oops, that, that uh, let me turn the video off. Hold on, sorry about that. Um, so the first one, you'll recognize this uh, is Malala uh, after she was, was shot in the head back in 2012. The day after this occurred in the hospital, her brain started to swell and she was, uh, she was given this treatment, a pharmacologically induced coma. Um, now th this is not her brain, um, but this is another brain with traumatic brain injury and you see uh, all the swelling that's occurring, right, and it's compressing the ventricle here on the right and, um, and over, over here you can see why this is a problem, right, if, if the intracranial volume uh, be, from swelling gets above a certain point, there's a precipitous rise in the ICP and this, this can be life-threatening. Um, so so why, why give these anesthetics? So here's a series of PET scans that shows you kind of why, what the idea is here. Um, so an, an awake person uh, with, it has a lot of you know, glucose utilization and, and a lot of blood bringing, that, uh, bringing the energy there that the brain needs. Here's the awake EEG underneath. And as we give higher and higher doses of, or sort of greater amounts of propofol to this patient, the, um, the metabolic activity in the brain is really dramatically reduced. And uh, the EEG signature of that state is, is this burst suppression pattern. Um, and, and so this, you know, because we need less blood, we have less volume, and this could, could save the patient's life or at least prevent an operation, uh, they otherwise, you know, which otherwise would have some morbidity or mortality. Sorry, either one could happen. Um, there's, there's a standard way, I'll just mention, of measuring the depth of burst suppression. Um, and, and this is called the BSR. So all you do is you take a, a window of, of the EEG. Actually, to get a good estimate of this, you'll need about a minute or two worth of, uh, of data if the EEG is not really in a steady state. More, more on this later, but you just take the fraction of the EEG that's suppressed in, in that window. Um, another idea um, closely related is the BSP. And, and this idea is just if I close my eyes and just throw a dart at this EEG at, at random, then the probability that I land on a suppressed period is the BSP. Um, all right, so, so the second uh, use of this medically is cardiac surgery. So some, in some surgeries, they have to, you have to really stop the heart put, op to operate on the arch, for example. And uh, usually a patient is given some amount of anesthesia, but, but the primary way to get into a deep, deep state of birth suppression is to cool the patient down. Um, at 15 degrees, we have about, on average, 15% of metabolic, you know, baseline metabolic uh, activity. Um, we don't always need to go that cold, uh, though. So here, here's a case, and uh, what I'm showing on the bottom is the temperature over four hours, um, starting at 36 degrees, and then down here at around 18 degrees. This patient's EEG is, is completely flat. This, that's what these red bars mean. And, uh, and this is when the surgeons are operating as fast as they can, and then the patient's rewarmed. Um, here's one lead of EEG, and you can see, you know, when the at a certain point we start to get these these bursts, and uh, and then we and, and in between them is the are the suppressions. Um, so three more plots. So here's a barcode representation that I'll use throughout the talk. This is just showing with black where where the um, sorry with white where the EEG is suppressed, and with black where it's not. Um, actually, I, in general, I'm going to just say burst when I when when I mean not suppression. Um, some people argue with me about that, uh, but it's, it's kind of it, that's all I mean by a burst is just a not not in the suppressed state. So there's no anesthesia here. That's all due to cold. So it's not all due to cold. This patient's getting isoflurane, um, and that's held at a constant uh, level. Um, and and so mo the modulation you see is I mean the isoflurane constant temperature is going down, and so but yeah you would not get this degree of burst suppression with without any anesthetics whatsoever. Um, and then, so the next panel is showing the sort of the spectrogram. So here's uh, on the y-axis is zero to twenty hertz, and uh, within, so you can see, you know, the the um, you know, what 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 different uh, you know, bands of activity, what what the what the spectral content of this activity is. On isofluorine, this is pretty characteristic. This very broad, you know, band of power um, up to about, you know, in this case, about eight hertz or so. Um, and as you go deeper into burst suppression. You, you can kind of see as these through these stripes, you can see that that structure is more or less maintained um, until we get to, into deep hypothermia. And I'll come back to that later as well. Um, and then finally, here's here's what the BSP is doing, right? So this is just quantifying, you know, the uh, the fraction of the EEG sort of instantaneously that's that's in this uh, um, that's in the suppressed state, right? And here when they when we're 
this is kind of our target to be at a BSP of about one. All right, so the last one I'll mention is um, refractory status epilepticus is kind of my favorite uh, or favorite favorite uh, reason for doing birth suppression. Um, the, uh, so you, typically we use propofol or, or midazolam nowadays. Um, in the past, uh, pentobarbital was used more often. And the goal um, with this treatment is, is really to stop seizures when nothing else will. Um, the secondary goal is, is really to, to kind of stop the brain from injuring itself to, by, by reducing the metabolic demand uh, placed on, sort of the, on the brain in this fragile state. Uh, here's, here's an example. Um, this is a standard you know, 1020 EEG with 19 channels displayed um, over 10 seconds. And every, uh, every second or so, you see this big burst of generalized polyspike activity. Um, believe it or not, this patient is in burst suppression. Um, so on the next page, you see suddenly, you know, synchronously all across the head, the activity just shuts down and it's more or less flat. We, we do have some muscle activity here, you know, some artifact, but the, the, the brain activity is pretty silent. And then, uh, then it turns back on and, uh, and just kind of alternates cyclically. All right, so, uh, the, uh, so those are, those are you know, medically induced uh, pharmacological comas. And uh, what about sort of spontaneous birth suppression? Does that ever happen? And the answer is yes. Um, so the uh, one example is in Otohara syndrome. So if, if you want to ask me a genetics question, this is the only possible place where you could ask it, and I won't know the answer. Um, but uh, the, this is also called early infantile epileptic encephalopathy uh, with suppression burst. And, and there are, there's a kind of a list of, of uh, genetic abnormalities that have been found in some cases, and I, I could not repeat the list to you, but um, in, in most cases that's not found, at least so far. Um, and there's almost always a structural abnormality of some kind. Um, and these patients are profoundly you know, developmentally delayed, um, and, uh, and this, this presents in infancy. Um, so here's, this is an EEG from a 16-day-old girl, and as you can see, when, whether she's awake uh, or asleep, you have this, this birth suppression EEG pattern. Right? Now, she's, this, this patient is actually not in, in, in a coma. Um, they, they're awake, um, but their, their brain is not working properly. A more common uh, case where we see this is anoxic brain injury after cardiac arrest, for example. Um, and... Uh, so you'll see patterns like this. This is obvious. This is a comatose patient, and the, the brain activity is very flat. And then when, when we see the bursts, there's epileptic activity inside the burst. Actually, in this case, the, uh, the day before this, the patient had continuous uh, you know, epileptiform discharges. Um, and actually, even before that, they had twitches, which kind of died out. And then this was the, the final state before the brain activity went flat. Um, Here's another kind of interesting example from Michelle Van Putin's group of uh, severe anoxic brain injury where, where the bursts, you know, this, these are actually, believe it or not, bursts from two different times in the EEG, and every burst looks roughly, you know, almost identical to each other. And so the, the brain activity has been just severely simplified in these cases. Um, and this, as far as we know, these patients kind of always, always uh, have a poor prognosis. Um, all right, so a little bit about the mechanisms behind this. It's kind of interesting that you can get you know, um, get the same basic pattern with, uh, with, with various anesthetics, with hypothermia, and with, uh, with pathology. And so what, what could the mechanisms be? Uh, so I'll just, we don't actually know what the mechanisms are at the cellular level or biophysical level. So I, I've got a list of different things that have been found, but, but the bottom line is that uh, that's still being sorted out and, and, you know, there may be more than one mechanism involved. Um, that the, the thing I'm more interested in is, is what can we say at a dynamical systems level? So it turns out that you can make some sort of mathematical statements that are maybe stronger, they're, they're, they're somewhat strong um, about the, uh, what the mechanisms are. And the basic, um, oops, so I, I'm going to try to get to that uh, by, by sort of a mystery sort of story. So here's some clues, and you have to infer what you can from the, uh, about the mechanism from these clues. Um, so the first clue is that it's a, this, this process is, is synchronous. So at least from the scalp, uh, if you put electrodes in the front or the back or on the side, when you look for the bursts, you're going to see them everywhere at the same time come on and, and turn off. Um, second one is that uh, the, if you, if you want to modulate the length of the suppressions, you can do that just by, by turning up uh, or down the, you know, the rate of propofol administration or by cooling the brain down more. Uh, or by, you know, if you have a rat model, you know, increasing the duration of anoxia, and you can make these you know, systematically longer 
or shorter uh, by by uh, changing the, the degree of depression of the of the cerebral activity. Or um, and then the next one is that the time scale is really very different from the background activity. So uh, in in the background, say awake EEG, most of the oscillations that you'll get are like a tenth of a second long. If you go into deep sleep, you'll get something maybe a second long. But in the suppressions, these these last 10, 20, 30 seconds, you know, sometimes you can get them lasting minutes. And so this really is a very different time scale and, and suggests that there's maybe some other process happening um, that, than, than the one that generates the background activity. Um, they, you've seen that they have this periodic or you know, cyclic uh, character. Um, and then finally, I actually haven't mentioned this, but, but there's been some pictures that show it, that the, uh, the spectral structure inside the, um, in the burst is about the same as right before the onset of burst suppression. So a little more about that. Um, this, is a, this is a series of spectrograms from different times um, in a patient uh, you know, getting ready to undergo surgery. Um, actually, I think this is the patient uh, uh, whose movie we saw. Um, and uh, down here, they're, ready, they're actually ready for surgery. If we maintain this state, this would be, this would be fine. Um, and uh, you see, again, with, with propofol, there's this kind of characteristic pattern where there, is, there are slow oscillations, and then there's this band of, of fast oscillations in the alpha range. Right, so if we go deeper, we'll get, uh, you know, eventually, if we really go overboard, we'll get isoelectricity. But in between, we get uh, burst suppression. And if you blow up this panel here where burst suppression has, has started, right, we've, we've changed state from here to here. And the, the structure, the spectral structure is really, in each burst, is about the same as right before we went into burst suppression. Um, and here, this is showing the same thing below just the average you know, uh, spectrum of each of these bursts. Um, and I should have mentioned bur a spectrum is you know, power as a function of, of the frequency of these oscillations that make up the, uh, the signal. So what does this suggest about the mechanism? Um, the, uh, so what it suggests, mathematically anyway, is that there's, there's a, a special kind of system that must be involved in this, or, or rather two systems. Um, and one, one is, is called, we call it the fast process. So it has dynamics that generate the background EEG, whatever that is. And that may you know, vary with pathology, right? So it looks different in seizures. And when, when in, a, in a refractory status patient, all the bursts have epileptic activity there uh, versus a healthy patient just receiving propofol or you know, it actually looks different when they're on sevoflurane as well and, and so on. Um, but in all these cases, there's a, some slow process that's modulating that. In a little, in a little more detail, um, so the idea is this background activity needs some kind of fuel, right? So a substrate, um, and we don't know what it is. In, in some, I'm going to just pretend it's ATP, so the level of ATP available for fueling the background activity. Um, but, but keep in mind, it may, may or may not be that. Um, and uh, and this, this fast process interacts with the slow process in two ways. So one, the obvious way is that it uses up the fuel, uh, uses up the fuel. Um, but there's also a homeostatic you know, regulation of the rate at which the fuel is regenerated. And uh, it more, you know, more vigorous background activity will lead to you know, more rapid uh, repletion uh, under normal circumstances um, uh, and, and sustain continuous activity. So there's, there are three ways in this, in this model that you can get burst suppression. One would be to interfere with this uh, process of making the fuel. The second way uh, would be you know, uh, to actually interfere with this homeostatic mechanism. So if we, uh, with an anesthetic, we do kind of decrease the amount of neural activity and, um, and then decrease the signal that's going into this recovery process. At least that's, that's our, the current uh, working hypothesis. And then we could, we could just use up the substrate too quickly, of course. So um, how does this work? Let me, I'm just going to show you a really simple um, mathematical model of this. And you don't have to understand the equation uh, very much. Um, so I'll just, uh, and actually I should mention that this is, this is just a toy model. There's a more realistic uh, you know, biophysical model that uh, my colleague Shenong Ching has developed um, that, that reproduces this behavior. But th this is kind of the simplest thing you can do to get, get the basic idea. So there's this, this is the rate of change here of this um, uh, substrate. And again, I'm calling it ATP. And there's two terms that govern uh, its, you know, how much of it you have. The rate of recovery and then the rate of consumption with a minus sign here. Okay, and then this U thing is something that turns on and off. Um, and then let's, let's just define this, this ratio. So the rate of recovery divided by the rate of consumption. Whenever this is less than one, then you're gonna at some point run out of substrate and, and um, 
in in this model and in the more realistic models, you have what this there's a nonlinearity that leads to the all the activity kind of shutting off temporarily. And uh, so so for example, when we have a, a 80 x is 80 percent, um, then what we what we get is uh, when when the EG is flat, this ATP level builds up, and we cross a certain threshold, and then the activity turns on. We we use it up, so we go down here. And then there's a lower threshold at which um, the, the consumption now stops. And then we have a recovery period while we build it back up and then stops. And it turns out that this, this difference between the two thresholds uh, is, is you know, obviously critical for, for the ability to have this continuous activity in between, well, while the uh, level is going down. Um, and it falls out kind of, you know, naturally uh, from these more detailed models. Uh, if we have 10% the rate of uh, recovery needed for continuous activity, then we get much you know, longer suppressions and much more rapid consumption. Um, and it, as simple as this model is, it, it actually generates some interesting sort of uh, true predictions. Um, the, uh, and so if, here I'm plotting uh, on a log scale the duration of the, uh, the suppressions in red and the bursts in black as a function of 1 minus x. So here's sort of, this is isoelectricity over here on the right, and then over here on the left is, uh, is actually just continuous EEG. Right? And so, um, Actually, if you if you take the you can compute the burst suppression ratio from these curves, um, what you get is this this interesting nonlinear behavior. And so this this says that uh, when I just barely go into burst suppression, all I have to do is increase the amount of anesthetic or hypothermia just a little bit, and suddenly I kind of shoot up to, to 0 0.4 or 0.5 BSR. And so if you were if you were the nurse, you know, can, and I told you, okay, please keep this patient at a BSR of 0.2. That would be a way of a form of torture, right? because all, that's not really. It's very very hard to do. You you kind of flip in and out of this state. It's not really stable, and that that turns out to be true in most most human patients and in, in rats. It's you really can't get worse suppression ratios that are stably maintained very easily. Uh, you know, lower than 0.4. Um, all right, and, and one more nuance here um, about the mechanism. So th this is actually a series of of uh, all the bursts in that hypothermia case I showed you earlier, um, just extracted, and they're color-coded by temperature. So notice here at, at 36 degrees, these bursts are kind of long, they're, they're juicy, they have high amplitude, and uh, they have a lot of this fast activity in them. When I get down to about 18 degrees, they're short and they're, they're small, and you wonder whether they're actually sort of simpler than the, uh, than the warm ones. Um, Here's a close-up at 19 degrees, these short little bursts, and then uh, at 30 and 32. And, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that the spectral structure is, is different in some way between these, right? So what's going on? And is this an exception to what I said earlier about the spectral content being preserved? Um, so on the left, I'm showing you the, uh, the average uh, burst spectrum at, uh, you know, in cold, and blue, and in the warm conditions in red. And, uh, you know, they're obviously quite different. Um, but it's, it's a uniform, more or less a uniform difference, right? So if I actually normalize for the total power, I get the curves to almost superimpose. And, and what this suggests, uh, we think anyway, is that, um, in fact, there's, this is not really an exception to the spectral activity being preserved. Instead, this is, um, this is the following. So it tells us about the spatial dynamics of, of the um, of burst suppression. So we think that in deep hypothermia, rather than the entire cortex getting recruited into, into the bursts, um, which would generate these big, you know, big amplitude bursts, we just get a fraction of the cortex involved, and then it looks really small in the scalp, but when you blow it up again, you see that this, the same basic you know, um, spectral activity is going on. Right. All right, so enough about uh, mechanisms. Let me tell, talk a bit about monitoring. And, and to motivate this, um, so those of you who raised your hands, you know, thinking maybe we're doing more harm than good, you know, one of the concerns that I have is that uh, maybe this doesn't happen here, but when I say, please, you know, this patient has refractory seizures. We'd like the, the patient as quickly as possible to be, you know, in a state with uh, one burst every 10 to 15 seconds. D don't go below and don't go above because we'll get, you know, unnecessary side effects from the anesthetic, lower, uh, if we're too deep and, and too light, we might have recurrent seizures. So at the end of the day, we, we go and check and see how they're doing. And then very often we say, oh my goodness, they're only, you know, halfway there. And they're just kind of too gingerly adjusting the anesthetic or people are busy, you know, it's, it's hard to be there all the time, or they've gone, you know, completely overboard and the EEG is completely flat. Um, so we want to do better than this. And uh, so, so to talk about how we might do better, I'm going to 
you know, discuss this in the in terms of this control system diagram. Um, so in, in a control system, uh, you have a you know the target level which which the user you know the physician or or anyone you know, healthcare provider sets, and then we have a we measure from the EEG in some way that I'll tell you about um, the the BSP, and then this generates an error you know so a discrepancy, and the controller figures out what it should do to adjust the infusion rate. And then the patient's pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics uh, determine, you know, what you see next in the EEG. Right. So we need to understand each of these parts in order to sort of safely control this process. So the PKPD, just to review, so pharmacokinetics, uh, you, you probably all remember, but if I give a bolus of propofol, this this means this tells me what the um, concentration will do as a function of time, say in the brain. Um, Pharmacodynamics tells me, as a function of concentration, what the what the uh, effect will be. In this case, it's BSP as a function of brain concentration of propofol. And then uh, putting these together, we can get the effect over time. Right. So um, if you actually were to go from the peak of the of the propofol concentration and watch it kind of wash out, you get a curve that looks like this. And it turns out that you need, or at least people usually uh, decide anyway, to, to fit this with three exponential functions. And, and this corresponds to a model like this. Where you have you know propofol coming in through this this IV into the blood compartment, and this is connected you know, with fast diffusion between compartments to uh, a small volume you know blood and liver compartment basically, and then uh, by a slow diffusion to this big compartment representing the kind of the fat tissues, and you can have you know accumulation of propofol here um, if you give it for too long. Uh, mathematically, this is actually there's a there's really is a fourth compartment, so the brain, but it, it's has very small volume. It's usually not included in the model, but uh, here it is. We need it in the model, and and this is just a system of linear um, differential equations, and there there are these uh, diffusion constants. Um, and it turns out that these are pretty well studied. These are known for humans. Um, and I, you probably can't read this, but but this is just a list of what the equations are for these diffusion coefficients, um, in uh, at least in a, at a population level, and they depend on uh, mass, age, sex, and height for propofol. Uh, we also know their coefficients of variation, so we have some idea of how they how they vary between patients. Right. So the, it turns out the pharmacodynamics um, are are actually not that well known, and in any case, they are it's it's certain that they vary dramatically between patients depending on their their health state, you know what what their pathology is, and what other drugs they're getting. So we actually uh, have to measure this in each patient, and uh, actually there's a safe way to do that though. Um, and all you do is instead of blast the patient with propofol to get them, you know, to induce them, you give it very slowly, you ramp, ramp the propofol up over 30 minutes, okay? So this is a, a simulation showing you how we're going to use this to estimate uh, the pharmacodynamic curve, which is, it's basically, remember, it's this sigmoid curve. It has two parameters. So what you do is um, with this 30-minute ramp, you get the, the, um, the bursts and the suppressions. And then because we're going really slow, we can actually take kind of big windows and, and we can just use this model free way of computing the, the burst suppression depth, which is the, the BSR. Right? So we just, at each point in time, we're effectively at, uh, sort of at a steady state. And so we can we calculate the BSR and that gives you this blue curve. And uh, you can't see it, but there's a black curve underneath this, which in the simulation is the truth. And, and you can see the BSR is, is a pretty good approximation to, um, to the steady state you know, uh, pharmacodynamics. And then um, now that we've got that curve, we can actually we can fit the the, uh, the sigmoid curve, and so this this creates this red thing, and it's a pretty good fit to the truth. All right. So next, um, how do we how do we actually take the EEG that we observe and form a signal that's a you know suitable for a, to put into a controller? And and actually, you don't want to use the BSR in this case because we're this this again. I, I keep on saying it, you need a big window to get a stable estimate, and if you if you put a Sort of a signal that, that takes two minutes to compute it, you know, into a controller, you end up with these lags create um, oscillations in the system, and um, and so we need a better way to do this, a way to do it recursively. So each as each data point comes in, we want to update our estimate, um, and and that'll work better. So um, the uh, this is it requires two steps. The first step is to take all the different ways that burst suppression can look. So this is six different patients, very different. But we, we just compress them to a single sort of barcode, you know, burst or suppression. Um, or really, really, the computer wants to eat zeros and ones, so we, we give it that. Um, so what we did, this colleague Mo Shafi and I at Beth Israel, um, we, we took uh, 12 hours of EEG from 20 different patients in burst suppression, 
to make sure that we you know, had a method that kind of worked across patients. And we marked every burst and every suppression um, in these EEGs. And, uh, at the, and then we tried to create an algorithm that would, would create the marks just at least as well as we could. And, uh, and it, this is, these are the equations. It, they, there's really just, uh, so I'm, I'm going to show you in pictures what they do. Um, so the, the first one really just computes a mean and subtracts it from the signal. So it, it effectively detrends the signal. In, in EEG, there's drift that's a problem. And then the second equation here just computes the, the variance over time. Right? And then we just subject that to a threshold. That's this third equation. And anything below is a suppression, right? Um, and this, this equ these equations just have three parameters, this beta, I sorry, two parameters, beta and this theta. So it's, it's quite easy to just tune this to an individual, to each patient um, if you need to. Um, all right, and, and here's showing for these 20 patients, you know, the, the percent agreement that we get uh, between each other. So the black bars are the expert versus expert uh, agreement levels. So some cases are easier than others to agree on. And then the gray bar is algorithm versus me. And then the white one is algorithm versus my colleague, Mo, Mo Shopee. Um, so we have, you know, you can see the computer does at least as well as we do, probably better. Um, and uh, all right, so we have the segmentation down. How do we do filtering? All right, so I, I'm going to just uh, I'm going to just show you some equations, and you don't don't have to digest them. But I, I want to say a couple of things. So th this these seven equations are the are the algorithm that we worked out to to give you real time updates to the BSP. And the things I want to just mention are. Um, First, that this, this matrix A, this, this has the pharmacokinetic information in it, all right? And, and, remember, and for humans, we're, we're going to use the, pharma, the population pharmacokinetic parameters in these, in these equations. And then this also, the estimates also require the pharmacodynamics, right? Down here, this is the, the sigmoid equation. And then the last thing to mention is that these, um, these are recursive. So each, if you look at these carefully, each one only depends on some result from the previous time step. You don't have to recompute everything each time you get a new data point. Right. So in pictures, this is how it works. Um, so uh, this is a simulation to give you the idea uh, of 12 hours uh, of, of propofol infusion. And uh, we're, we're using some perturbed pharmacokinetic parameters to generate the data. So we pretend like we don't know those. And then we use the population PK values um, in the estimator. Um, and this, which makes it a little bit, you know, should make it more challenging for the, for the thing, but more realistic. And then we use the PD values that we estimate from this ramp experiment. So this is an evil anesthesiologist kind of turning the propofol up and down at random. And then you can, you can see the, uh, the, the uh, concentrations in the four different compartments. The green one is the slow compartment, right, gradual accumulation of the drug. And then here's the true BSP. And this is what we observe. Um, all right, so the estimator, you know, it, it actually looks about the same as, as the truth, which is, you know, that's precisely what we want. Um, and if you take the difference between the effect site concentration and the estimate of it, it's this red line, which is, you know, again, this is, it, it works just fine. All right, so uh, just for fun, as eye candy, here's a couple of examples of showing you what kinds of results you get when you run this on real patient data. Now, I can't tell you what, what the truth is about the, you know, the, the um, effect site concentration here, but at least the estimates... Are, are good, uh, you know, are nice and stable and smooth. And here's a patient at BSP of 0.5. Here's one who's, uh, you know, they're taking, someone's taking way too long to get this patient with refractory seizures into, into birth suppression, 75 minutes, but they eventually get there. Here's somebody with an ICP problem being held kind of at target. Uh, all right, so now last thing to, to talk about is, is control. So how do, we, how do we put these components together into a controller? Um, and, and, uh, the, uh, the method we use, there's actually quite a bit of fancy theory uh, in, in, in control theory land right now, but, but this, the, more than 90% of all industrial controllers use this simple method called PID control. And uh, it's, it works fine for this problem, it turns out. So this is, uh, all you, what you do is you take the error term right, and you, you uh, compute three parts uh, and add them together to get the response of the controller. And the first part is just, it's proportional to the error. Okay, and the, Constant of proportionality is this KP. The next one is just an integral term. And you, you, so if you've been off target for a long time, this term builds up and builds up. And, uh, and the response will be bigger and bigger um, you know, in, in a direction to drive the error towards zero. And then the last one gets bigger if, if the rate of, 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 of you know, increasing of the error or decreasing of the error, uh, actually, if, if it's increasing fast, you'll get a bigger response. So, and there's a well worked out theory to try to pick these three parameters, you know, to, to get the types of behavior that you want. Um, and a little more on that in a minute, but the, uh, 
Let me show you how it, how it works um, in some animal experiments. So here's a, our computer. Here's our infusion pump with a, with a syringe of propofol in it. And then here's our volunteer. Um, with, he has a, a, a tail vein IV and then an EG coming out uh, back to the computer. Um, and he's on a you know, warming blanket here. And uh, these are so some of the experiments that we do um, in the rats. Um, so first we, we start out with giving a, a bowl. Actually, so this is a little different from human experiments because these are healthy rats rather, rather than clear, critically ill patients. Um, and so what, what we do is we give some boluses at the beginning and, and we actually estimate both the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics for these rats. So the experiment looks like this. Give a bolus, the EEG up here becomes flat and then the bursts appear and then we, we calculate this BSP um, Here's, a, here's another example where we give two boluses. Here's the response in gray. And then we fit a PKPD model and get this red curve. Right? And, then, and then this goes into the synthesis of the, of the controller and the estimator. Um, and this is how, kind of how it works when it's all put together. So the, the red line is showing you what we want. Right? This is our target level. We're holding each of these levels for 15 minutes. Um, and, and the black is the, uh, our, what the controller is able to get the mouse to actually, or the rat to actually do. You can see the tracking is, is really quite good. Um, down here is the infusion rate that the uh, controller is generating, going kind of up and down. And, and you know, needless to say, this would be pretty hard. This, these frequent adjustments would be hard for anybody to do at the bedside. They're, it takes too much work. Um, and then here's another rat where we're going from like 0 0.9 to 0.6 or to 0.4 to 0.65, um, just to show that the controller is able to kind of move, move the, uh, the BSP around wherever we want it to go. Um, we didn't try to go below 0.4 because of what I told you earlier. Initially, we thought, oh, maybe we could hold it 0.2, but that, that really is an unstable state um, in rats and humans. Um, and then here's just a summary of the sort of for these different levels, 0 0.4, 0 0.65, and 0.9, for each of six different rats, the errors are pretty tightly you know, clustered around zero. All right, so now in humans, uh, we have not done this in humans yet, but we've done a lot of simulations and we're about ready, so I hope I convince you we're about ready. The biggest issue to worry about in humans is is safety, right? and and uh, this actually relates directly to the the fact that we um, are not able to give these big vigorous boluses of propofol to these uh, to human patients for safety reasons. And this means you know then so we rely on the the population PK values, but they're not right for any one patient, right? They're only in the ballpark. So so here's a simulation showing you this problem. So I'm I'm simulating four hours um, of a patient who's who at time zero is given, started to give propofol at a, at a constant rate. And this is, I think this was a 65 year old, 175 centimeter tall, 100 kilogram male patient. Um, but, uh, and here's the expected you know, response if the, if the population values were right. But then we've, we've taken a thousand sort of simulated patients by perturbing the values using known coefficients of variation and, and shown you the envelope of, these, of the responses uh, in the light blue here. And obviously, you know, after four hours, you can be really far off, right? You can be either over overdosing or underdosing this patient uh, su really substantially, right? This is one reason why actually there's open loop control systems that are kind of popular in anesthesia in Europe, um, but they've never been approved in, in the U.S. For, for kind of for this reason, because we know that that uh, you, you can't really predict very well how any individual is gonna, going to, how their, um, uh, what their concentrations really will be if you just let it free run. All right, so how do we deal with this? Well, actually, before that, before I deal with it, it's actually worse um, because there are also disturbances in, in you know, the real, real, world, real setting. So these are things like the patient being, you know, ET tube is suctioned or they're turned in bed or in, their, you know, level of pain changes or their physiology changes in some other way. And uh, we, we can model this as if we have uh, some, you know, effectively a, a, an extra uncontrollable and unpredictable source of propofol effectively, you know, coming in and act like either sucking propofol out of the patient, making it less effective than we think it should be, or, or putting too much in, right? So this is, this is how this is modeled usually in, the, in, in control theory. And, and there's a, so the, the math is a little bit, you know, beyond the scope of the talk, but I'll tell you that the basic idea in robust control design is um, that there's a fundamental trade-off between performance and robustness. So on the one hand, you know, we, we'd all like the system when we say, okay, go from zero to 0.8, we'd like it to do that really fast. And we like it not to overshoot much. We'd like it to kind of settle into a steady state pattern as quickly as possible. And then if we move the target around, we just want it to, to follow. Right? But all that depends on knowing 
doing that, you know, sort of optimally or really fast depends on knowing the actual values of this of the model. So if you want to, on the other hand, though, we don't know those, right? So so what you have to do is you have to worry about uh, these other objectives, which are what if I don't know the PK values precisely? I don't want that to matter that much, right? I want I want the system to be, behave about the same no matter where in this some neighborhood the system really is. And I, I just make the neighborhood big enough that I'm pretty sure my patient is in it, even if I don't know exactly where. I also want, when these disturbances come, I don't want the patient to wildly fluctuate, right? And I also want, uh, if, if there is an, an error you know, that uh, I need to minimize, I don't want the system to just create a big blast of, of, uh, of drug and, and uh, put the patient in danger. And then um, if my measurements are not you know, completely precise, even actually in this case, they, they are actually pretty good, but, but if they're not, I still don't want that to affect the performance. And so there's, there's, some, you know, there's some recent, uh, recent theory that, that tells you how to kind of make the compromise between these things. And um, I'll just show you in, the, in a, some simulations how the final robust control system actually is able to achieve these, these, this nice balance. Um, so here's this, in this, in this simulation, there's actually a red curve under here, but you can't see it because our system is so awesome. Um, but uh, so this, in this red curve, we're, we're pretending like this is 24 hours of, of treating a patient with refractory status epilepticus. And we initially induce them, go up to a state of about BSR of 0.8. Um, and then we hold for eight, for eight hours. And then we imagine that someone says, oh, please turn it down a little bit. You know, the blood pressure is dropping. So we go down hold for another eight hours at 0.6, and then we taper down to 0.2, right? Now, now the black curve shows that we're, we're doing a great job of tracking. And this is despite the PK uncertainty, the fact that we actually didn't know, but you know, had to measure with this ramp experiment, the PD parameters. And we have this, this is this disturbance, uh, which is actually quite big. Um, this red line is showing, you know, this is constantly like a, this, this disturbance signal coming in. And, um, and, uh, down here in blue, you see what the controller is actually doing to keep keep us on target. So every time there's a dip, you know, in the disturbance, you see very shortly after there's a rise in the uh, you know, the rate that the controller is delivering to the patient and uh, compensating for that. Right? Another thing to notice is that there's there's really no sudden moves that this controller is making, and and very importantly, it never gets up to this red dashed line. So this is a upper upper limit uh, of sort of safety, 12 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, per hour that we don't ever want to cross. Now, in practice, if it ever did, if we needed something like that, an alarm would just sound, and, and you would, it wouldn't give it. Um, but but we actually don't get go don't get close to it. Um, and then also we we're tracking down here the sort of the average rate um, over the last hour. So the idea is maybe you could temporarily go high as long as you didn't you know stay high for very long. And we don't get close to this seven mix per kilogram per hour uh, limit either. And this this is just a second uh, example. Um, so we've done this in, in a sort of factorial design set of experiments, uh, you know, varying mass, age, sex, and height, uh, each one 100 times. And, and again, in, in, in simulations, which we're, we've tried to make pretty realistic, um, we get really excellent performance, um, certainly clinically acceptable. So the, uh, the bias, this is a measure of just how far off we are at, you know, at, at when we're trying to maintain steady state. And we're less than 0.1% off uh, at the median value. We're never more than 1% off. Um, the wobble, this is a... A statistic that summarizes just how much how much oscillation there is when you're trying to hold steady state. That's less than two percent. Um, the rise time when we make a switch from zero to 0.8 is less than two minutes. Settling time, you know, so it does it goes up and then it it overshoots a little bit and it kind of settles down. But that that takes less than ten minutes to settle down to within this very narrow band of of uh, plus or minus two percent. Um, and then the overshoot percent is less than ten. Um, and then finally, the, I, as I already kind of suggested, we don't really overdose this patient at any point in order to achieve this performance. Um, so this is a sort of a demonstration in, in a simulation anyway that, that we, we seem to have a controller that's able to perform clinically you know, within acceptable limits um, in, a, in, a, in a safe way. All right, so just to, to summarize what I've told you, um, so you know, burst suppression is this state over here in the EEG in which the, the brain is profoundly kind of depressed in terms of its metabolic demand. Um, and this may be, you know, there's at least a good rationale for doing this in several different conditions. Uh, probably the strongest one in terms of evidence is the cardiac surgery one, but uh, we do it whether the evidence is good or not in these other cases. Um, the, the mechanism, although we don't know, you know the details, um, at a sort of abstract level seems to, at least I, I can't think of any other model that, uh, that, that could explain it, it seems to involve some 
so a fast slow process right uh, which um, involved it's a, a, in a depletion recovery cycle and then finally uh, it, it, the, this robustness issue is really important for developing any closed loop systems that you're going to use in in actually in humans um, and I, we, we seem to have a, a framework that's able to both you know uh, monitor in real time the depth of burst suppression and then in simulation anyway uh, the uh, control the the system despite uh, the realistic amount you know uncertainties in the system and these disturbances uh, so in the future we're actually in the process of getting uh, FDA approval to try this system in uh, in a pilot study in humans and then eventually once this is uh, you know, we're sure that it's safe then uh, my my suspicion strong suspicion is that we'll if we try this for refractory status epilepticus and compare what we get the kind of the outcomes that we get you know, with and without a tight level of control will probably uh, have better outcomes with uh, when we're using uh, closed loop control. Um, in fact, the evidence is starting to suggest, although I think there's problems with, with, with it in these couple of papers that come out recently, that uh, maybe, you know, the way that we're doing things currently maybe really is causing uh, kind of more harm, more harm than good. And so um, we just, I'll stop with, you can read the, uh, the uh, sort of um, who my collaborators are, but I'll stop and take, take any questions that you have. Thanks, thanks a lot for listening. I mean, there's a lot, there's a number of parameters in the model, and, and I guess the, for example, the fact that the simple model seems to work pretty well, and one wonders which parameters are important and or most important, and some may not be. Important. Which simple model are you talking about? Well, for the, you showed the toy model initially. Oh, you mean for the mechanism of burst yeah, suppression? Which yeah. Which I gather, did you use that? In, did you use that uh, in any way in the in your further algorithm? No, no. So that, so no, that that model of how burst suppression comes about is is uh, just explain it is trying to be an, an explanation of, of what what's going on. Um, the it's not used in the control system at all. So you, you can use that as like as a model for the real system and control it, um, but uh, but no, no. I mean, act, act, but it actually doesn't have that many parameters, by the way. No, no, that, model doesn't <laughs> that one doesn't. Have, yeah. so that, Shannon's model point. has a lot of parameters. Exactly. And, so exactly. So yeah, that's why I like this one better because it's you know it, it just does the job of trying to explain you know, how can you get this behavior. Um, but but you know, on the other hand, you, you want to see that well. What if I if I at least put realistic like, currents in there and and make a network? You know, does it kind of without too much work produce the behavior that you think it should? And and then it does. So, for example, one one problem seemed to be in the in estimating the, the multiple parameters uh, in the pharmacokinetic net. So, using three time scale, which is six parameters, three yep. parameters, and you would imagine that uh, estimating a long time scales would especially be problematic if you're trying to do it for a given patient, for sure. Yeah. And it, is it? And you know, certainly in other scenarios, people have suggested that time invariant processes and uh, often work just as well as multiple. Exponential processes, and then you only have one parameter. So I'm wondering yeah. whether you tried. That. So, so um, actually, I, I forgot to repeat your questions. I think so. So let me try to repeat your question. So Brian is saying that um, I think that uh, why don't we? You know, we have this we have this model that's like four dimensions, and there's multiple parameters for the pharmacokinetics. Um, and could we use a much simpler model? And uh, especially if we wanted to sort of estimate it, that might be a really good idea because you, you you need. You know, like so, for example, the long, long time scale. You're you're right to estimate that accurately. You probably need a long observation period, right? And you don't have that. You you want to so um, there's the 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 short, so just to be really clear, the 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 mechanistic model has nothing to do with with that. But we have actually tried um, we have tried a, a much simpler pharmacokinetic model, a, just a, a two dimensional one, which only ha it turns out only needs two parameters. Um, and uh, the, it doesn't work well at present, and the reason is is that if you keep a, it, it actually works well locally. Like so, you can actually fit it to a small amount of data, but then actually the the, the patient changes over 24 hours. If you're ignoring the slow dynamics, right, they effectively after they've accumulated propofol in the fat compartment, it's it's like an unknown source that's you know that you haven't accounted for that leaches back out, and now it so your model is no longer accurate anymore. Um, the controller itself compensates for that somewhat, um, having a closed loop system, and 
it actually works okay. We don't want to tell the FDA though that like, oh, it's so fine, you know, just it's an okay approximation that gets worse over time, but the, the controller compensates. So, so we're actually just we're using this this the you know population model partly for for those reasons because we you know it's we know what the model is. We um, but but in the future, our, our, what our thought is, the what we think will be better is actually to use this very low dimensional model and have an adaptive estimation uh, scheme that, uh, that just learns, you know, as the patient's, um, you know, EEG changes over time, it takes advantage of this uh, you know, sort of whatever natural excitation of the system there is uh, to estimate just a, sm a small number of parameters. That, that probably will work better. Uh, but but it, there's, there's some technical issues that are like pretty important when you, when you try to introduce an adaptive estimator into a closed loop control system. Um, you know, nobody does that. My understanding from, talking to engineers who do build airplanes is that that's a crazy idea I mean, the theory is not uh, it doesn't you have much less of in ways of guarantee that, uh, that you'll have st a stable system when you do that even though you know in systems where it doesn't where life and death are not you know in the balance you kind of do that and it very often it works really well it's probably a very complex question but how do you go about um, designing a, the model that uh, or designing a closed loop system not just for a healthy rat, but for a neurocritically ill patient with brain damage. And the, the, I'm not sure there are differences yep. in the protodynamics of pharmacokinetics injury versus healthy brain. Yep. And yep. Yeah, so so it's um what you do, I mean in, in the um we see if I can give a, a good an okay answer, but basically um, you so we, we measure the pharmacodynamics is that you know from using that ramp experiment. Uh, for, for, so that, that applies to this individual patient. That, that's actually a very important part of it because just, just giving midazolam, which is often done simultaneously with propofol, will shift the pharmacodynamic curve. Um, and it'll take a lot less propofol to induce birth suppression. So you really need, you need to do that part. Um, the, the pharmacokinetics, um, we think, will not be affected as much, although you know, in a, it, it, they may. Um, but what you do in, in design, the idea of robust control is to say, well, okay, I, I, I think my system is here, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to allow for the system actually, when I design, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to get rise time and, and uh, you know, overshoot and all these things. I'm going to constrain them to be no more than, you know, X, and you pick whatever is clinically acceptable. And then subject to that constraint, you say, I want the system to, to do that. Even if it's in a ball, you know, somewhere around what I think, you know, the uh, population model says, of you know, with an error of say 50 percent, you know, which is, and it's if you, as long as you believe that it's very unlikely for for a patient to be that far off, then the your, your ro robust control design <coughs> guarantees that the thing will stay stable and and you can guarantee that it will meet these um, these constraints. So that's the general idea: is you you you, you allow for a, you know quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, around the you know nominal operating point, and if it's wrong, you know you also build in safety things you know to, into the system. You say I'm, I will never let the rate, even if the pro, you know if the controller thinks it needs to give a, a rate of propofol more than 12 mg per kg per hour, it just it can't. You know, and, and it'll, an alarm will just sound. Or if it's you know if the error is bigger than something for a certain amount of time, then you know then sound an alarm. So you can always revert to manual control um, if if you're you know, if it really doesn't work, but uh, we, we shall see. I, I think it will work. I think you'd have to apply different models, or could use the same use the same model for different types of brain injury, but not so great. I I think the main yeah no I, I don't think we'll have to use different. The pharmacokinetics shouldn't depend much on the on the brain injury. They may depend on like the liver injury or the you know the the kidney you know the state of the kidneys, um, but probably not on the brain injury. The pharmacodynamics are are going to be the thing that mainly vary between patients with different brain injuries. So, for example, um, actually we're looking at this right now as a sort of before we, we do real you know, our, our pilot studies, but um, my, my impression has always been that in, there are certain patients with anoxic you know, status epilepticus that really seem to require much higher doses of midazolam and propofol than, um, than, than anyone else, right? And, and they, their, their brains just want to have seizures, um, and so their, their curve is, way, is very different, right? Um, there's other patients, especially elderly patients, um, uh, who get status, and, and just a little bit of drug will will do it. So, but that's that's the pharmacodynamics, that, and that's actually really, thankfully, you know, very um, simple to address with a, this kind of you know very safe, um, slow uh, experiment. Yeah. So, so 
is there evidence that keeping a brain at very deep burst suppression for 24 hours or more is damaging or, or is it or not? That it's damaging? Yeah. There's no, there's no evidence. Well, uh, not really. So not, not the act of, there's no evidence that, that doing that alone is damaging. Um, there's also not a lot of evidence. There's, there's, there's really good rationale, but there's not, you know, hard evidence from a randomized trial or something that, that shows that, that doing it is beneficial either. What, what there is evidence for is that, you know, if you, if you can choose between, say, intubating a patient or not and giving high-dose anesthetics or not, when, when you can um, make that choice, you know, you, you, they're, doing so will, will buy them a long time in the ICU, uh, may buy them, you know, infections they otherwise wouldn't be at risk for. Um, and so, so you're definitely making a, a risk-benefit calculation when we do that. We, we actually don't know, though, uh, exactly how the, where the balance, you know, how it, how it falls out. But, but it's, it's pretty safe to, I mean, um, there are some papers coming out that suggest that, uh, you know, on, on, I think, weak evidence, but, but nevertheless, um, that, that inducing a pharmacological coma uh, for refractory status um, does not improve outcomes. Now, how is that done? You know, it's done the way I said. <laughs> Please induce, you know, get them to this state. Well, 12 hours later, they're not there. You know, it's not under, you don't have a careful way of controlling this. Nobody in these studies has quantified, you know, how, how well they've actually done at, at getting the seizures under control and avoiding overdosing. So um, I, think, I think it's an open question, but it's, it's likely that we do quite a bit of harm or expose the patient, patients to a lot of risk when we do this. So what do you mean by avoiding overdosing? I mean, so to make this, the most people believe, you know, that, that stopping the seizures is what's necessary. And that can be done without making the patient isoelectric, right? And so by, by overdosing them, I mean taking them to a deeper state of burst suppression than is actually necessary um, for, for the, you know, therapeutic effect. And it's, it, but there's not necessarily any harm to doing that. Oh, no, there is. I mean, you'll, you, as soon as you start doing this, you need to start giving the patient pressors um, almost always. Um, and uh, and then the, the drug accumulates. So even once you turn it off, if you've had it on for 24 hours, if it's propofol, they very often you know take they're they're exposed to another you know, 24 hours or so of of, uh, of ventilator time, um, and then the the risk of delirium may be increased. You know if maybe that's the least of their concerns in this case, but but uh, you know, that's that's also related to uh, having you know, deep levels of, of anesthetic uh, coma. So there is, there is, there seems to be some some really clear risk um, here, e even if not directly, you know, the, the drug damaging the brain. There's probably probably there isn't that, uh, but these systemic risks are there. All right, all right. Thanks we a lot. Got a couple oh, of yeah. questions behind. Oh, we have questions. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not used. To, uh, let's see. How do you suspect your PD parameters will dip? Yeah. Okay. So we answered that. Could you test the impact of your controller in animal models of status? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are working on that. We don't have a great model of, of uh, animal uh, status that kind of really mirrors what we get in the ICU. Um, so we're, we're trying to see if we can get uh, animals to seize for a really long time and not to stop having seizures at the first dose of midazolam. That, that's a little bit of a challenge, but uh, we're working on that. Now we can clap. All right, thanks a lot.